All right, folks, welcome back to our coverage of the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville. I'm Chris White. To my right in the passenger seat is Chris Mikowski. Behind me is Dan Davis, and we are going to do something a little bit different. You might have just watched our um, Lee Jackson bivouac site video. We hope that you did. Um, this time, we're actually going to follow the flank attack. This is going to be an in and out of the car video. You're going to see GoPro footage. You're going to see a little bit of drone footage. You're going to see a uh, uh, us uh, visiting with some other historians along the way. We're going to hit some of the highlights of Stonewall Jackson's 12 mile flank march around the Union Army. A lot of people ask how you do this and where to go and different things. Well, it's going to take us about a half hour to make the drive, roughly. Um, and with us jumping out, it'll take us a, a few more minutes because we are long-winded. Um, so we hope that we stick, you stick with us. We also hope that you head over to battlefields.org, check out all of our Chancellorsville items that we got for you. We also have the free Chancellorsville Battle app. Head over to the iTunes store as well as the Google Play store. You can download that for free. And you can check out all of our uh, other items that we have at our YouTube channel, Facebook, as well as Twitter. And we hope that you'll subscribe and uh, also maybe become a member of the American Battlefield Trust. So we're about to embark on one of the most famous marches of the American Civil War. I'm not walking this. I know people who have done it but we're going to drive it uh, and take you along with us. Chris, looks like you got something to say here. Well, it's just uh, important to remember that this is a much wider road than it was once upon a time. Uh, guys could walk about four abreast on that as they're making their march, and the road's not much wider than that. It's a dirt road, um, so that means they're going to be kicking up a lot of dust. It had rained a few days prior to the battle, so that's going to keep some of the dust down. There's going to be some muddy spots along the way, in fact. But when you've got 28,000 guys <laughs> marching down a road, of course, the guys in the back of the column are going to eat a lot of dust, literally eat a lot of dust. This road is a road that, uh, this part of the road shows up on the maps, goes to the furnace. We're going to see that in just a few minutes, but there's a portion of the road that doesn't show up on the map, and that's why Charles Welford, owner of the Welford furnace, uh, or owner of the Catherine furnace, um, is able to provide such key intelligence to Jackson because, you know, hey, your map doesn't show this road. I know it's there. I cut it myself, bringing timber to my furnace, and so that local home field advantage is going to but such a key role here for Jackson. Uh, it's going to be hot as they're making this march. They're going to be told to be as quiet as possible as they're making this march because they don't want to give away the um, sort of rolling nature of their position across the battlefield. The forest is going to do a lot to tamp that noise down, but it's not going to be a completely silent move. And the Federals will eventually get word of what's going on. We'll talk about that along the way, too. So a beautiful day to be out here today, but it's not anything like what it was like for Jackson and his men as they're marching down this road on this top secret mission. Yeah, as we're rolling along here, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We are heading south along what's called the Furnace Road in 1863. We also call this road uh, into this uh, McClaws Drive. This is part of Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, and we're within their Chancellorsville unit. Uh, this road itself, as we head to the south, we will be heading down towards the Catherine Iron Furnace, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes when we visit there. Off to our right, about a mile and a half from where we are, off to the west, that would be Chancellorsville. So, uh, now it's about towards the north-northwest of us. Off to our left is the east, and that is out towards Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg, the city, is about 11 miles to the east. The Confederates will approach this battlefield from our left up into this area and then march down this road. Um, one of the sites that you can stop along, this is not a, an official stop on the uh, Fredericksburg driving tour, the Chancellorsville driving tour, but this is a stop here at a place that shows up known as simply the, the Brick House. Um, we also call it the Polium House um, uh, after the war, but this was the site uh, of the birth of Matthew Fontaine Mari. Uh, Mari was born out here, I think, circa 1806 in the Chancellorsville Woods, and he is a, a Confederate admiral. He also teaches at the United States Naval Academy before the war. He's known as the uh, modern father of oceanography. He writes, I think, the first book on oceanography. I'm not an oceanographer, so I can't say that that's a 100% fact, but there was a house here up until about 1820, 1821, whenever a brick structure, which shows up on a lot of our maps, just as the brick house, the Pulliam house, shows up out here. Um, by 1810, his family had moved away, but this was the birthplace of uh, the famous oceanographer, uh, Matthew Fontaine Maury. Jim Stewart's going to use his house as a headquarters in the early part of the battle here. Uh, of course, he will be on horseback for the second half of the battle, and uh, then, of course, on the front. Um, but he's going to use this because it's a convenient spot. Chris talked about Lee's uh, central 
central location on May 1st, and that's why Stuart is going to be close by so he can provide information, uh, you know, tap into that network of intelligence, and then get it to Lee quickly. As we continue down the road, we're kind of heading down into the valley of Lewis Run, and this is where uh, Jackson's first going to lose the top secrecy of his movement. He's been told to keep things quiet, keep things moving. Just another day in the office for Stonewall's uh, foot cavalry, but as they march past this gap in the trees, uh, it's going to reveal their location to some federal gunners who have some uh, lookout posts off on a hill to our right, a place called Hazel Grove. They're going to see this butternut column move through this gap in the trees, send word to their commander, uh, Dan Sickles, who is looking for a fight. Um, he's not going to be allowed to advance down here at first and instead is told to bombard the column with artillery. And so artillery shells are going to come careening down that gap in the trees at the uh, column and guys are going to be able to literally see those cannonballs coming a mile away. They hustle through. Not any real casualties, but the jig is up. Jackson's movement is now on the radar screen of Joe Hooker. Yeah, and what's interesting about uh, Jackson's movement is uh, he's already ridden down this road toward the Catherine Furnace. He did so the day before during the fighting on May the 1st. He is accompanied, as Chris mentioned, by Jeb Stewart during this ride. He rides down to the Catherine Furnace. He has a brigade under uh, of Georgians under the command of a fellow named Ambrose Wright with him. Uh, he gets down to the Catherine Furnace, and interestingly enough, he's going to come under Union artillery fire before returning eventually to meet with Lee back at the intersection of the Orange Plank Road and the Catherine Furnace. What is also, I think, interesting about this engagement is that uh, Jeb Stewart's adjutant general at the time, a fellow named Channing Price, is going to be mortally wounded by uh, that Union artillery fire. And uh, in, to take his place, Jeb Stewart's going to appoint another fella uh, by the name of Henry McClellan. If the last name sounds familiar, it should be. Uh, Henry McClellan is a cousin of the former commander of the Army of the Potomac, George McClellan. And for those of you who are uh, also familiar with Henry McClellan, uh, he writes, I think, uh, to be one of the finest memoirs about uh, his Civil War service. I wrote with Jeb Stewart, The Life and Campaigns of Jeb Stewart. If you ever have an opportunity or have read that book, it is a fantastic resource for historians today. Just to keep us oriented as we came down the hill past the gap in the trees, we reached a V. If we were to have turned right there, that would take us in the direction of Hazel Grove. Instead, we have turned left, and that brings us to Catherine Furnace. We're going to get out and take a look at the ruins of Catherine Furnace, and our friend Tim Talbot from the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust is here waiting to meet us. All right, so we're now magically out of the car here at the Catherine Iron Furnace. Now, this is all that is left of the Catherine Iron Furnace. And at one point, this was the smelting stack. This stack would have been 36 feet high. Um, this would have been a very impressive uh, facility that would have been actually in an open hillside behind us. All these trees would have been taken down. Um, there would have been workhouses up there for the laborers. There would have been uh, coal houses up there, charcoal houses, different things that you would have had here. It would have been a whole complex out here in the woods of Spotsylvania County. Now, one of the reasons we have this furnace out here is because the area is very rich in iron ore. It's also very rich in gold ore. Prior to the 1848-49 gold rush in the United States, Virginia was the largest gold producing state in the U.S. Uh, you can go up the road to Gold Vein. There was a vein of gold there at one point, and that's one of the reasons that we call it Gold Vein. So in the uh, pre-revolutionary days, we had a lieutenant governor here in Virginia. His name was Alexander Spotswoods. Spotswoods will come here into this area and decide to bring in some Germans who are very good with iron smelting and iron working. And he wants to create a community and take advantage of all the iron ore that's in this natural area. And then they'll also take down the virgin forest of Virginia to help create charcoal, which will then uh, create this industry of both iron and gold. Uh, so if you look at the name Spotsylvania, what that means is Spots Woods. Spots Woods was his last name. Spots is there. Sylvania means woods. So if you think of Pennsylvania, that's Penn's woods. If you think of Transylvania, that means vampires. Actually, it means beyond the woods uh, or beyond the forest. So that's what Spotswoods means. It's just another way of saying Spotsylvania County means Spotswoods. So as we're down here, I'm going to bring on Tim Talbot here in a moment from the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust. Think about this area. This has been much more open. This would have been owned by the Fredericksburg Iron and Steel Manufacturing Company at the time of the battle. In fact, this area, you'll need about 100 acres of, of wood to take down to create charcoal to uh, fuel your furnace 
and you will only be able to create about two tons of pig iron, which are basically long um, bars of iron known as pigs that you could then make other things with. So that's what we're gonna see here at Fredericksburg, out at the Chancellorsville area. We're gonna see a lot of gold and iron ore that'll be uh, dealt with here on these battlefields. So I'm gonna bring Tim on uh, to talk a little bit about the Catherine Iron Furnace. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so it's a perfect uh, mix here of what's going to be causing, call, causing what's known as the wilderness. Uh, as Chris mentioned, there's a lot of iron content in the ground. Uh, and of course, to fuel the furnaces, they need a whole lot of heat as well to smelt that, um, to make that into the iron ore. So all that combined, cutting the woods, it's going to be growing back as well as the poor soil content. Uh, is going to prevent the trees from growing really fast so it's all going to be sort of a perfect mix to making this what is known as the wilderness um, and uh, the, the road that we're is right in front of me and right behind uh, Sarah with the camera here is going to be the road that Jackson is going to be taking on his route of his march um, and as they are making their move there's part of the Union Army that is going to see them as um, they're attempting to make a retreat and that's gonna be the 11th Corps um, coming in behind them. And Jackson is gonna place part of his troops, uh, particularly one regiment, um, Emory Best, 23rd Georgia, as a rear guard action there. And they're gonna actually have some fighting here uh, on uh, May 2nd as the Confederate column is gonna be heading off down this road behind us. But this is a very important area, this is a very important intersection. Uh, that's why Jackson has uh, these troops here to, to, to protect his rear. Okay. Yeah, and so just to orient you uh, quickly, uh, up to behind Sarah is where Jackson's coming from. He is going to make a left-hand turn where the car turned, and it's going to go down this road, which we're going to follow here in a few moments. Um, that's Jackson Trail East, and then eventually we'll pick up with Jackson Trail West. But coming from the north, about a mile and a half to the north of us, or behind me, will be Dan Sickles and his 3rd Army Corps, 18,000 men strong, and they're roughly the center of Joe Hooker's line. Hooker's line is facing towards us, kind of in this direction, and then the right flank of it, the right of it is refused just slightly, um, which we're gonna talk about that in the car, about the incompetence of the right uh, flank commander for the Union Army, a guy named Oliver Otis Howard. And then it'll run down the road, the Orange Turnpike, and then turn back towards Banks's and the United States Ford, which is on the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers. Uh, so that's what Hooker's line is gonna look like. It's five miles long, and it's about a mile and a half from where we are. So Dan Sickles, known to some as Devil Dan Sickles, will all throughout May 2nd say, there's something going on in my front, let me move forward. And eventually Joe Hooker relents around noon, well past the time that Jackson's column is down this road, and he is going to start sending troops down here. Burdan sharpshooters will come down into this area, some Pennsylvania troops. And as they come down into this area, we have to remember, we're in the woods today, but this was somewhat of a neighborhood. Um, the Catherine Furnace sits up here behind me. Uh, down the road would be the Welford House, which we're going to stop by. It's no longer there. But off to my left would also be some other homes. We would have Hazel Grove, Fairview, the Chancellor home itself. Um, and folks are looking for places to take refuge. Remember, the Union Army has arrived here on April 30th, and folks are starting to see that there might be a battle here, and they start to come down here to the Welford area and down to the furnace. One of those ladies that came, uh, one of the ladies who, who flees from Fairview, which we'll visit tomorrow on our, our videos, will be a lady named Roberta Moxley. Uh, her, her maiden name's Men, uh, Monroe. I have to try to get, get this right because it's a little bit confusing. She's gonna come down to the furnace and unfortunately for her, she's about to go into labor. And on May 2nd, 1863, we have Dan Sickles' Third Corps moving into this area, creating a huge gap in the center of the Union lines. Then down here, we have Confederates who are gonna put up a rear guard, those 23rd Georgians that Tim Talbot talked about. Then we have this poor pregnant woman who can't be moved. So what does she do? They, she's, been, she's placed in a small building that's around, uh, that used to sit up on top of the hill and probably one of the officers, the surgeon, um, a, a Mr. Madison, a Surgeon Madison of the 23rd, is going to place six guards around this little building, have them fix bayonets and put white flags on those bayonets and march in circles around this building while she gives birth so that nobody comes down here to in, in hurt her. In fact, the baby's born, it's healthy, and she is going to name it Madison Lieutenant Monroe. Monroe's her maiden name. 
So that's going to be the name of this child here, uh, born in the midst of this battle. Uh, but the Catherine Iron Furnace itself uh, will be destroyed in 1864 by George Armstrong Custer. Dan Davis is over on the side. I know pumping his fist because I'm mentioning Custer. Uh, he'll destroy it. The furnace itself will be rebuilt in the 1880s uh, by another company, but it doesn't do very well, and it's actually going to fail again. The iron industry by the American Civil War had basically been tapped out here uh, in this central Virginia area. It only comes back because of the American Civil War, and then after the war ends, they try to revive it, and it just doesn't come back. So this furnace industry had basically sat almost abandoned since the Mexican-American War in the late 1840s. Chris? So this area is really important, as, as we keep t saying, because, you know, as Jackson's men pass through this area, it's going to take them hours to do so. So the delaying action of the 23rd Georgian off to my left uh, becomes crucial. When they get here, uh, Jackson knows there's a farm road that goes off to Hazel Grove. That's why he peels the 23rd Georgia off. They advance several hundred yards up there, act as a screen, and that's really going to be what allows Jackson to move here, feeling like his flank is protected as he goes. This column is so long, 28,000 men, that by the time he meets up with Fitz Lee at the end of the road, and we'll stop there in a few minutes, the tail end of his column is still passing through this area. So it takes hours for them to get there. That's why he's ultimately only going to launch his attack with two of his three divisions, because the length of this road. Now, this also becomes important then because as uh, Sickles advances guys down here, Chris mentioned Verdan Sharpshooters, fantastic unit. They have some tough times, sharp fighting, and the Georgians slowly give ground and they're falling back in this direction. They'll be fighting among the complexes, Chris mentioned. They'll keep falling back. But then Sickles is going to shift more guys in here. He's convinced that he's got the, the Confederates on the run. He's going to ask Oliver Otis, Oliver Otis Howard for help. And Howard's going to personally lead a division down here to feed men into this fight. Lee's going to respond by extending his left flank down to this area in a hilltop behind Sarah uh, that overlooks Lewis Run. So he's going to extend his line. We're going to have uh, Federals feeding in here. As the story unfolds for us today, pay attention because the Federals are looking at this spot. Lee is looking at this spot knowing something else is going on. But this really becomes the center of attention, which is going to draw away a lot of resources, a lot of men, and of course, a lot of commanders. And that's going to allow the story that unfolds to unfold the way it does. All right, so we're going to continue along and, and follow Jackson's flank attack here. So stick with us. Okay, so we're back in the car. We are going to take what's called Jackson Trail East. This was not what it was called at the time. This is the Furnace Road leading down to the Catherine Iron Furnace. And as you'll notice, it is uh, just a graded road today with gravel on it. On the left and right hand side of the road, there are some features. They're, they're tough to make out at times, but we will come across the original bed of the road. At times, this road's actually in the original road bed, and at times, it's actually adjacent to it. Um, you might see some low points off to the right hand side of the car, and you'll see some flat points. And you can actually follow the, the furnace road um, in the woods up to the furnace and up to the, the unfinished railroad cut, which we'll see next. So that's pretty neat. You'll come across uh, some pits in the area. These pits were sometimes the iron pits where you would get the iron ore from. If you know where to find them, you can find them on the Chancellorsville battlefield as well as the Wilderness battlefield. Um, and they're nothing fancy and they're nothing exciting, but it, it's kind of cool to, to find. Um, and then we'll also have out here, you know, some other features. If you walked up to the Catherine Iron Furnace, which you can do, you're going to have to uh, make a trek up there, you can still see the outlines of the old buildings, which are really neat um, to get a feel of the footprints of those buildings. But the original road trace would be off to our side of the road here shortly. It would lead you between the house as well as up to the Catherine Iron Furnace. And we are heading roughly south southwest in the footsteps of Stonewall Jackson's men. He has between 28 and 31,000 men that he is going to lead on a 12-mile circuitous march around the front of the Federal Army. As Chris Mikowski mentioned at the last, um, at our last stop at the Iron Furnace, you know, we have Dan Sickles who thinks that he has got Stonewall Jackson on the run. In fact, Joe Hooker is going to interpret this as a Confederate retreat. Um, and it's logical because Gordonsville, Virginia, according to a sign down there, the fried chicken capital of the world, which I don't know how you get that that uh, moniker, but that's cool. Um, they uh, uh, That is a, a 
area where there's Confederate supply system. Specifically, we have the Virginia, Virginia Central Rail Line running through there. And we also have some other um, uh, amenities for the Confederates that they could take advantage of. So could the Confederates actually move down to that area and retreat? Maybe. Um, uh, and that's what Joe Hooker is going to think. And I'll we'll come back to that in a moment. But I'm actually driving up into, and you're not supposed to do this, just to turn in to give you a view of the unfinished railroad cut here. This is all that's left of the unfinished railroad cut. Today it's used by a utility company. On the right-hand side of the road, there would be a unfinished railroad grade where the 23rd Georgia Infantry will make uh, most of its final stand. They'll fall back past the iron furnace to this point and utilize a deep cut. This was an unfinished rail line between Orange Courthouse and Fredericksburg. Eventually, it the uh, line will be completed, but this railroad is important during the Battle of the Wilderness. This is where the Confederates will make an attack on May 6th, a flank attack of their own, where James Longstreet will flank attack the Union and he be wounded by his own men. Uh, then we will have this flank attack here. This will also move through the Salem Church battlefield and the Fredericksburg battlefield. So this is an important feature on many of the battlefields in the area. Yeah, Federals will actually advance along this unfinished railroad at the Mine Run campaign. Take the well. microphone. I'm trying to drive. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't make the mistake, though. The um, utility line here is the top flat open part. A lot of people mistake that as the old railroad. But, uh, bed, but it's actually down off in the right, uh, paralleling this new utility line that was just recently uh, reinstalled. So uh, this is as far as the 23rd Georgia makes their stand. Their Colonel Emery Best decides, guys, uh, we've had all that we can take. It's time for us to skedaddle. He gives the order, but doesn't wait to make sure his men actually receive the order. So he and a few of his staff officers will run off to the rear, but the 23rd Georgia mostly stays and will end up captured. Uh, more than 200 hundred of them will end up hauled off to the rear as prisoners. Best will get uh, taken up on court-martial charges uh, after the war and will be drummed out of the army for cowardice. I shouldn't say after the war, uh, after the battle, uh, and he'll be drummed out on uh, charges of cowardice. Yeah, and, and um, so what, what we're now going to do is jump out here at our next stop. This is the Welford House site. These are the folks who run the Iron Furnace during the American Civil War, and their home stood here into the probably 1960s-ish. We're not exactly sure when the house was uh, uh, taken down, but we're going to jump out here, check out this spot along the jo Jackson Trail East. Okay, so we jumped out of the car here. We're at the Welford House site. So the house site actually would have been right behind me. This would have been a brick structure here along what we call today Jackson Trail East. Jackson Trail East is actually easy to find. Sarah pointed out one of the telephone poles back here. That will be the road itself. That is will be Stonewall Jackson's force moving through that area behind me off in that direction towards the south, southwest. Eventually, they're going to hook up with another road called the Brock Road, modern-day Route 613, which we'll go on to a little bit later today uh, and during this video. Make a left and then make a quick right onto what we call Jackson Trail West, which is on the west side of the Brock Road. So we'll follow along there, but the Welford House site um, was an interesting place. Jeb Stewart comes through here on May 1st. On the evening of May 1st, one of his staff officers that Dan mentioned earlier, Channing Price, um, was wounded and then dies, um, basically of blood loss. And Bob Crick told me the story years ago that whenever uh, uh, Stewart heard about this, he actually sent one of his staff officers down to Richmond and told them to go and pick up tourniquets and bring them back because he never wanted this to happen again. Uh, so while he comes through here, the body of Channing Price will be laid in the Welford house. Um, they'll come through here visit, but also going by will be Stonewall Jackson and his foot cavalry as we call them. Uh, Jackson's marching orders for this day are very simple. He wants you to march for 50 minutes and then you get a 10 minute break. March for 50, get a 10 minute break. And for your afternoon meal, you get 15 minutes off. So he wants to make as much time as possible. Jackson wanted to start marching at about four o'clock in the morning on May the 2nd. He doesn't start marching until between 7 and 7.30 in the morning because he wasn't feeling very well that day. And I'm sure Chris Mikowski will talk about that as we, we uh, move along here. 
But the Welford house, the Welfords owned the Catherine Iron Furnace at the time, or at least they ran it. Um, they had had a house on Lower Caroline Street in Fredericksburg, which was heavily bombarded during the Battle of Fredericksburg. So they came out here at some point, took up residence here in the Welford house. The house itself survived the war. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the car, I think in the 1960s-ish, we say between 1956 and 1972, the house disappears. Um, but you can come out here, stop along the road, and you can check out where Stonewall Jackson's men would have been marching past. And this house that once stood here on this knoll behind me was a great witness to history. Chris, anything? Yeah, and uh, it's really kind of one reason we know about a, a, the life here at the time is uh, Welford has a niece that's staying with him for the summer, and she writes this great account of what it was like to have Jeb Stewart and the cavalry show up, what it was like to have Jackson's guys march by. Uh, Charles Welford and his son Charles Jr. both flee into the woods to hide as the Federals come through because they're afraid that they're going to get captured or hauled off or arrested or something. And the the uh, four women who are left, including the niece and including Welford's wife, uh, start packing stuff up. They're afraid that their possessions are going to get looted as the Federals begin their advance up through here too. Uh, so they had a very good encounter with Stewart's men. Then they get really afraid as the Federals start getting close. So again, again one of those kind of neat stories about how the war unexpectedly touches these civilians. Uh, but the Welfords play this key role in this battle because they provide that on the ground intelligence that Jackson's going to need to get his men through this area off into the distance, off into history. We're going to hop back in the car, keep following that route, and tell you more about that story. Okay, so now we are following yet again in the footsteps of Stonewall Jackson and his foot cavalry as we're heading on. Jackson Trail East. We are heading roughly south, southwest. We're going to eventually hook up with the Brock Road as we're going along and we're following again in the footsteps of the famous May 2nd, 1863 Confederate attack at Chancellorsville. The idea is to hit the Union Army who's off to our right. Um, we're adding distance between us and the Union Army right now. They're probably about four miles from us. And as we keep going farther and farther towards the south, Joe Hooker's thinking, the Union Army commander, that, man, maybe these Confederates are retreating towards Gordonsville, which would be logical. They could go to a supply base. They can also get more reinforcements. And they could fight in the open and not in these choking woods that we have around here. In fact, he tells Dan Sickles, his now lead corps, he believes, who has moved down to the Catherine Iron Furnace to get 60 rounds of ammunition, to bring on three days rations, because the next day, May 3rd, 1863, they will be the vanguard of the Union Army chasing down Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee as they retreat towards Gordonsville. What the Federals cannot see is that that huge Confederate snake is starting to turn to the right. They're starting to turn towards the north. Um, and that is eventually going to put them onto the right flank of the Federal 11th Army Corps, which is the right flank of the Union Army right now. And we'll talk a lot about those guys in some upcoming videos. But just to say that the communication failures at Chancellorsville are deadly for the Federals is an understatement. There are so many communication failures, be it that some commanders aren't following orders. Other commanders are sending messages that are taking forever to get there because they're having problems with the telegraph system. We'll have others who are getting lost in these woods. It will take three or four hours to deliver a message. So the Federals are having some real problems. And one of the things they wanted to do was move an entire corps of about 18,000 men, the Union First Army Corps under John Fulton Reynolds, onto the right flank of the Union Army. But those guys were at Fredericksburg. And to get them over here, we had to send a message. And it takes forever to get that message over there. And by the time this Confederate attack takes place at 5 o'clock, the 1st Corps is not there. It's only the 11th Corps. And only about 800 of them are facing out towards the west. But in the meantime, before we get to that point, we have to follow in the footsteps of Stonewall Jackson. Jackson is the only Corps commander on the battlefield for Robert E. Lee. Lee's actual second-in-command, James Longstreet, over the winter of 1862-63, had moved down to the Suffolk and Norfolk, Virginia area. Today, two and a half to three hours by car. He's down there to help uh, bring supplies up to Robert E. Lee, to lessen the supply burden here in the Fredericksburg area. It got so bad here in the Fredericksburg area over the winter that the Confederate uh, citizens started calling their Confederate defenders lice that they couldn't get rid of. One man said that the bird known as the chicken was extinct in this region. So there's some supply problems. 
So Lee only has about 60,000 men. He sends Longstreet down on this independent command with two of his divisions, um, uh, about 14,000 men down to the south. Here at Chancellorsville, we have Stonewall Jackson, who is technically Lee's third in command uh, in the normal command structure. Now he's second in command. He has all four of his divisions at Chancellorsville. His uh, first division will be marching down this road led by Robert Emmett Rhodes, a 34-year-old Virginia Military Institute graduate, um, a, a hard fighter, uh, Douglas Southall Freeman, the Confederate, uh, um, uh, the writer of the Confederate uh, memoirs, basically uh, Lee's lieutenants will call him a Norse god, um, a clad in Confederate gray. Um, he is uh, leading the march column. Following behind him will be Raleigh Edward Colston. Uh, he's an interesting character to talk about a little bit later. Then following behind will be A.P. Hill with his light division. There's nothing light about them, 12,000 men strong. And basically the mortal enemy of Stonewall Jackson is A.P. Hill. The 4th Division, under the command of Lee's Battle Man, Jubal Anderson Early, will be stationed in the Fredericksburg area, holding that front uh, against about 26,000 Federals, and we'll cover them in another video. So, marching down through here, leading the way will be Robert Rhodes and his division of about eight to 9,000 men. Followed behind will be Raleigh Colson's division. Followed behind that will be A.P. Hill. We'll have wagons, we'll have cannon, we'll also have Fitzhugh Lee, the nephew of Robert E. Lee and the bane of Robert's existence whenever he's at West Point as superintendent. Fitz is always getting into trouble. Fitzhugh Lee is leading the cab out here, the eyes and ears of Lee's army and the eyes and ears of Stonewall Jackson's marking, marching column. Chris, as we're driving through here, um, you know, we're seeing some logging off to the right. So there's a big clear cut over here that if you were out here um, just a year or two ago, you would not have seen. We've passed a couple houses. There's a big, beautiful horse farm out through here. Along the stretch of the Jackson Trail, uh, the Park Service owns a 20-foot 20, 20 right-of-way on either side of this road. But otherwise, uh, there is land out here that is available for development, and it is being developed. Um, from a preservation point of view, you sort of make some decisions. Is that worth saving? or not. Um, no action happened there. Jackson's men marched by it. And that's one reason why the Park Service is really kind of concentrated on the integrity of the route itself rather than trying to buy up a lot of property on either side when that money might be better spent preserving places where there's actually blood-soaked ground or where fighting actually took place. Uh, but it's always a hard choice. It's a tough decision. And I know people come out here, they look at this, why is there a house? And they get really upset. Um, and those are the hard choices that we have to make as preservationists uh, when we we're coming up with priorities. So, uh, uh, you know, take a drive out here for yourself, look, see how things are, uh, but understand that, you know, there's also a neighborhood out here and it's kind of spotted out through these trees. Yeah, it's a good point, Chris, because legitimately, Jackson's men marched right past this. That's what they did. Um, they weren't off into the woods. In fact, Jackson wants to maintain secrecy during this march. So he's going to tell his men not to cheer, to try to tie down any loose articles. Believe me, the secrecy has already been blown. We, we, we went past a, a portion of the battlefield where the Federals are lobbing artillery shells at Jackson. Then we've also engaged with them at the Catherine Iron Furnace, but he still wants to maintain that secrecy. He also has to maintain his assault force and keep it a cohesive force to launch his attack. Remember, we are coming out of winter quarters. The last major battle for the Confederates and the Federals in the Eastern Theater was Fredericksburg in December of 1862. We had the Mud March in 63 and we had some other things, but for the most part, these guys are now getting their marching legs underneath them. Let me uh, interrupt just a real quick. We're gonna take a left here. We're at the Brock Road. Were we to go right, it's a shorter way to get up into position for Jackson's men. But there's a road that kind of comes down and would reveal their position called Herndon Road. So by taking a left here, they're gonna be able to circumvent their uh, that position at Herndon Road, keep their secrecy, as Chris said. Uh, then the column's gonna take a turn toward the north. And that's here as we turn onto Jackson's flank mark. March, uh, west. Did you and, blink? Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's how long we're that's, on Brock Road. <laughs> and it's actually a tough spot to march for folks who do make this march, uh, typically on the anniversary. There are a lot of folks that come through here. That's a dangerous stretch to march because there are little dips and uh, swales. 
traffic can't see you, there's no sidewalk. It's probably the most dangerous spot on this battlefield for a pedestrian. Yeah, and I mean, it's 45, so naturally in this area, you're gonna do 75 down that road. And when I worked for the Park Service, one of my jobs was putting up the uh, boundary signs, and one of the most dangerous places to do it was Brock Road, as well as the Orange Plank Road. Um, we're now, we headed south along the Brock Road to our left would be Spotsylvania Courthouse. About eight miles away, that famous May 1864 battle, that will take place about eight miles to the south of us. Now, as we come around this corner, we're starting to go north, northwest. We're starting to make the turn north towards that federal flank. This was an unfinished road. This was a road that was a logging road, as Chris mentioned. And so the Federals don't see this on their maps. Maps during the Civil War were notoriously terrible. Um, north and south, uh, you know, the Americans were not well mapped. And if you actually go on to uh, historic map websites to collect maps, which I do, my wife and I, we collect maps, some of the most expensive maps uh, are not the ones that we own from the 15 or 16 or 1700s. They're from the United States in the 17, uh, 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s because the maps were so poor and they were so far and few between. So this doesn't show up. Dan mentioned the Bureau of Military Intelligence at one point. Um, those guys... You know, they, they are really good at putting together an order of battle, you know, who is where in Lee's army, but they don't put together great maps. That's the engineering department. And they do a lot of work along the riverfront, but they don't know every road. So as Jackson's moving along through here, he knows he has secrecy, but he has to keep his men together. Remember, it's the first March of the campaign season. It's gonna be unseasonably warm. They're moving down these roads as quickly as possible. He's marching them for 50 minutes, giving them 10 minutes off. So he's pushing them hard. He's putting officers in the back as well as um, the provost guard with bayonets fixed to keep men moving so that stragglers aren't falling out of the ranks. Great incentive. <laughs> yeah, great incentive. Hey, come on, we're gonna go try to get you killed, but keep moving. Um, you know, it, it's a, that's what, what we're seeing out here. And, and constantly what Robert Rhodes will talk about throughout this battle is that, that he doesn't really give many orders, Jackson press on, keep up, press on, keep moving. Those are basically his orders. Um, because once he gets into position later on, and we're in our next videos talking about this, it's basically point this big mass of Confederate angry infantry in one direction and go. And it is just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. We just passed a little uh, development called Custer's Trace. Uh, Dan Davis has lit a candle for Custer uh, as we pass by. Now we're descending into the valley of um, uh, Poplar Run. And this is gonna be the halfway point for Jackson's men. It's really the only water source they're gonna have over the course of the day. It's a great little spot to stop and uh, get out and poke around. Uh, just a little trickle of water across the road today but when it rains this can actually be three or four feet deep because you have drainage through here uh, that really floods quickly uh, so Jackson's men are not allowed to stop here and refresh but they are allowed to uh, quick grab a drink top off your canteen and keep going so it becomes a sort of a welcome spot for Jackson's men as they go uh, it's a little dispiriting to kind of come out of here this used to be pretty thick woods but uh, some of that clear cutting we talked about happening off to our right uh, there's a big farm that's been here for a long time on our left they've done a really nice job of keeping things beautiful out here um, but uh, uh, Poplar Run drains from our left to the right. It's part of the Nye River Basin. Uh, all of these little trickles and streams come together to form the Nye River, which in turn join up with the Poe River, the Matta River. They all create the Mattapanai River. They're going to then flow down into the North Anna and uh, eventually down into the York. Uh, as is the case, rivers around here flow from west to east, and so they create really difficult topographical challenges for armies that are moving north to south. That's why Lee has been so successful at defending this area over the course of the winter because he's had his line along the Rappahannock and he's been able to prevent the Federals from coming south. The Rappahannock is going to serve as a pretty important barrier, but that's going to be the only real barrier, uh, any, any water barrier that the Federals are going to have to contend with during this battle, unlike other places where streams and creeks and rivers are going to cause cause significant problems for the armies as they try to maneuver. Chancellorsville in that regard will be relatively landlocked 
uh, aside from, of course, that major Rappahannock. Yeah, we've been talking a little bit about George Custer and uh, the Union Cavalry, something that actually has uh, is working in Jackson and Lee's favor, that, that there's not that much Union Cavalry here at Chancellorsville. As part of Hooker's grand plan, he decided to send the bulk of his cavalry command, reorganize into a corps under the command of George Stoneman south to try to, uh, to get between Lee and Richmond, wreck havoc along uh, Lee's lines of uh, supply and communication, trying to pry Lee out of and from behind the Rappahannock and get him to withdraw closer to Richmond. And had Hooker had cavalry here, you could probably make an argument that Jackson's flank march could have been detected. Hooker may have indeed reacted differently than he did. Uh, the fight at Catherine Furnace would not have been the magnet that it really becomes, that it really becomes uh, Hooker's focal point throughout the course of the day while all the real action is taking place or will take place off to, uh, to the west. Jackson, on the other hand, has Fitzlee's cavalry screen out here. He's able to further shield, not only using uh, the wilderness, the forest, but also utilizing Fitzlee's cavalry to shield uh, his uh, march from Union's uh, pickets to Union skirmishers. Now, as we've gotten into this area, off to the left of the car are actually some earthworks that you can see. Uh, some places in better than others, as the uh, foliage is, is blocking the view in some places. These are actually earthworks that were built during the Wilderness Campaign. We're coming up on the Brock Road, Plank Road intersection in a few minutes, and as Federals tried to defend their position there, they extended their line down to the south, and so these are all earthworks that were built so that they can uh, protect their left flank as Lee is trying to push against them on the 6th and 7th of May uh, as that fighting uh, really kind of extends off in this direction. So we're approaching Brock Road, plan uh, the Brock Road here. This is where Jackson Trail West meets up with the Brock Road. We're going to um, hook back up with it to our right. If we went right, that would take us to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Going north here, this is going to take us into the Wilderness Battlefield. One of my favorite stories from Poplar Run, which is an, a, a basically a spillway across the road. To give you an idea of what it would have been like to go through that area wasn't a spillway at the time and there's cobblestones and those wouldn't have been there but I remember coming here for the first time with my dad in 1994 and my dad's a car fanatic um, you know one of the reasons I'm into the Civil War is because my uncle you know his is uh, what would have been his 71st birthday is today and he got us to Corvette Carlisle dad loved to go to car shows and we came down here to Fredericksburg and I remember we came up on Poplar Run and dad didn't understand at first that that was an unpaved road and it was dusty and then he had to go through Poplar Run, which made the car muddy. And I remember in the middle of our vacation, we had to go find a car wash to make sure that we washed the car <laughs> to, so that, that it was taken care of. That's that's my dad, Whenever, in a nutshell, whenever it comes to his love of cars. Um, I love history like he loves cars. So, so we're coming up the Brock Road, heading north. Um, this is course the same road that the Federals would have been marching down in the opposite direction we're going on the night of the 7th and 8th of May as they're heading to support towards Pennsylvania in 1864 but Jackson's marching up this direction on the 2nd of May 1863 as he's trying to get himself into position on the um, complete right flank of the Union Army. He's got Fitzley with some cavalry support at this point and initially Jackson was hoping to come up here to the intersection and take a right but Fitz said hey uh, you might want to check this out a little bit because I think we're gonna have some problems and so Fitz is gonna lead Jackson and his staff to the right here at this intersection they're gonna go down a couple miles to a place called the uh, Burton farm and uh, give Jackson a pretty high spot where he can survey the battlefield and he would end up coming in not on the Union flank uh, but a few hundred yards into the Union line that's not good enough so he's gonna readjust his march plan come back to this intersection and lead his men straight as we're going now. He's going to take the opportunity to send a message back to Lee saying that his men are up, they're making good progress, and hopefully God will grant them the, the benefit of a success. It's going to be the last message that Lee is ever going to uh, going to receive from Jackson, uh, although of course they don't know that at the time. But Jackson is feeling really good about his prospects. He's pleased about their progress. As Chris mentioned a few minutes ago, though, the daylight is ticking away. And so now it's not just about getting into position on the Union right flank, it's also a race against the clock. We need to get into position in time to be able to do something and be effective about it. Because once this attack unrolls, Jackson still needs enough daylight to see it through. And if daylight uh, evaporates, 
the wilderness, you know, the wilderness is going to become impenetrable to see in, and Jackson's going to run into problems. So really now he's got to get into position. So this detour is going to set him back uh, longer than he had anticipated. So we're going to see Jackson start to get a little edgy at this point. Yeah, so you, the, the wilderness is so thick. The foliage is so thick, according to one soldier, that it, even at the brightest point of the day, in places you couldn't see the forest floor because it was that dark. Um, it, it's Most of the trees are about 30 feet high. There's a lot of undergrowth, jagger bushes, grapevines, poison ivy, anything you could think of. So there's a lot of uh, problems getting into position because Jackson will arrive on the flag attack area around 2 o'clock, the lead elements. But it'll take another three hours to get everybody in order before he can make that attack. And as we came up this road, this is the Brock Road. We're heading straight north. We're about to intersect with the Orange Turnpike. Um, you may have seen an upturned cannon on our left-hand side about a mile back, and that would have been the mortuary cannon for uh, Alexander Fighting Ellick Hayes, who was uh, killed near that spot on May 5th, 1864, during the Battle of the Wilderness. It's one of the few monuments on the Wilderness Battlefield here at the Valero Mart up on uh, the plank road they call it up here this is uh, the orange turnpike um, we are going to make a right onto route three uh, off to our left is the wilderness itself um, we're crossed through there on our drive from the germana ford past where uh, jackson will be taken back for his uh, amputation and wounding uh, after the, the his wounding on may 2nd that took place just off to our left by a couple hundred yards that would have been the wilderness tavern off to our right uh, by a few miles will be the Chancellorsville Crossroads, but more importantly for Jackson, once we reach this point, is we are coming out towards the right flank of the Federal Army. Now, Oliver Otis Howard, who is in charge of the 11th Corps, um, he is going to be out on this, this side of the battlefield. Hooker repeatedly, as well as staff officers, will say, look off to your right make dispositions to meet the enemy. He will claim that he had sent skirmishers a half mile out. He did not. Both the skirmishers will say they only went out a few hundred yards, and the Confederates will say that too. They only engaged with the Federals a few hundred yards out. Dan mentioned the lack of horsemen out here for the Federals. Um, there'll be a, a squadron out here that's sent down the, the Ely's Ford Wood Road, which will be off to our left-hand side, um, down the road a little ways. Uh, there's a squadron sent out front. That's two companies uh, sent out, I think, of the 17th Pennsylvania Cav. Um, they go out for a 10-minute ride. They rode out and turned back and said, hey guys, there's no one out there, don't worry about it. How far can you go in 10 minutes? Because you only rode five minutes out and you rode five minutes back. And there's word coming in from officers who can hear things. They send a signal officer down the road. He's the only person out here for the Federals. So really, there's not precautions being taken taken advantage of by the Federals. They have all day to take, take precautions. They don't do so. We'll talk more about that in another video. And we've just passed the area where Jackson's men began to assemble. And uh, as they do so, uh, they're going to have a line that's going to stretch a mile to the south of this road, a mile to the north of this road, and then he's going to stack his divisions um, one behind the other with AP Hills coming up in the rear as the reserves. He can't wait for them to get here because, as I said, he's running out of daylight. So those are going to come in as they become available. Now, it's been a hot March. It's been dusty. Temperatures have gone into the mid 80s. These men have gone at a pretty good clip as Jackson has marched them along. Chris mentioned earlier at a pretty fast pace. Um, and uh, men are falling out with heat stroke. Guys are falling left and right out of line. Jackson's surgeon Hunter McGuire will have to tend to a lot of those. And so as a result, they won't be there to pay attention to Jackson himself, who's going to be bundled up in his India rubber raincoat. He's going to be complaining uh, at various points of having the chills, but he doesn't have time to be sick. He's running a fever. That's why he's so bundled up, even in this heat, uh, but nobody notices. Um, Chris mentioned earlier, he's giving orders like press on, press on, onward, onward, and he is pressing on himself. Doesn't have time to be sick. Uh, that'll come later. And of course, the ramifications of that will become important later as well. So we're, we're pulling up to uh, the Jackson flank attack area. This is tour stop number eight at the Chancellorsville Battlefield. This is where we're going to end this video. Uh, we do hope that you check out our battle app and you can go download that at the iTunes store, Google Play store. Um, that's free. That'll tell you all about this battlefield out here. But before we sign off, this is some of the area where we've been doing a lot of work recently with our partners at the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust. The, the American Battlefield Trust have been working to try and preserve land out here on this battlefield. We'll visit some of that 
uh, some of that land later on today uh, in another video. But this is the open fields that we finally get to of the Tally Farm, the Burton Farm, the Hawkins Farm. We found another small neighborhood here at Chancellorsville, and Stonewall Jackson's men will come from our left. Now they will come from behind us and roll towards the Federals who would have been stationed out in this area. We're on the extreme right flank of the Union Army, the 11th Corps, under Oliver Otis Howard and we're gonna pick up our next video from this spot. I wanna commend you for your abilities to not only interpret, but also drive safely. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you being my microphone holder, Chris Mikowski. Uh, he does it all, folks. You know, he's an interpreter. He worships Stonewall Jackson. He can hold a microphone as well. But on behalf of Tim Talbot, we have Sarah Byerly, who's behind the camera, Dan Davis behind me, Chris Mikowski. I'm Chris White. Please share this with your friends. Go over to, to Facebook, to Twitter, to YouTube. Subscribe. Check out uh, all the great free content we have. Go to battlefields.org. Learn more about how you can become a member of this organization. And of course, we thank you for watching and supporting battlefield preservation and education.